citizen. Oh, oh, oh. Out of many we are. We are world citizen. Same vision is for equal rights and justice. For the people, them, what's happening to this beautiful world that we're living in? World citizen, lift up your voices. Welcome. Welcome to another episode of the People Powered Planet Podcast, where each week we have extraordinary guests, guests focusing not on all the horrible problems of the world, acknowledging them, not totally open, or totally aware of them, but talking about solutions. How do we move from that depth of despair over the problems of the world into solutions? Today, we have a very, very special guest. Uh, we have Beatrice Finn, who is the executive director of ICANN. ICANN, the International Campaign for the Abolishment of Nuclear Weapons, was the instrumental coalition that helped bring about the treaty, the treaty to outlaw nuclear weapons. Uh, she is an extraordinary, she's a, she's a mother, uh, she's juggling you know, a, a very full life and yet has managed to play this crucial role uh, that is touching the world. Um, maybe before we get into talking about her, her nuclear, her, her uh, going to, uh, to going to receive the the Nobel Peace Prize, let's just start off on a little personal note. Uh, <laughs> tell us a little bit about first of all your your childhood and upbringing and what led you on this kind of path. I uh, thank you so much, Arthur. It's really really nice to be here, and hi everyone who's uh, listening into this. Um, yeah, I mean, I've always been, you know, through my parents really engaged in politics and the world. And I grew up in this suburb in Gothenburg out um, in on the west coast of Sweden, which is has a really kind of um, significant immigrant population. I think in my class, as I was in, in uh, a small kid, there was only there were maybe two or three kids that had both parents that were born in Sweden. Um, so it was very multicultural, very diverse. And, you know, there were kids coming in from all these different areas in the world, from Iran, from Chile, from Somalia, from the Balkans, of course, which was a really big part of my childhood, the, the war in Balkans. And I, to me, it was just sort of in particular, the, the war in Balkans was like a bit really traumatizing for a lot of Europeans, I think, to have such a big war very close to us. And I remember as a child being very confused because I couldn't figure out who, like, there, there were Bosnians, there were Serbs, there were Croatians. It was really confusing. And I couldn't figure out who the good guys and who the bad guys were. <laughs> and it was sort of like a first sign to me how complex war is and how there are no good guys and bad guys there are no clear like like it's just really really awful and puts a lot of people at harm so, so here you were also, here you were in neutral in sweden where it's so supposed to be peace and quiet and you were deluged with hearing about all the wars all over the world yeah. and the turmoil and, or just like you know the kind of revolution in iran and what, what, what happened there or the pinochet regime in chile or the big starvation in, in, in somalia for example all of these incidents and, and, and things and crises and conflict happening around the world and sort of having an impact on on me in in sweden yeah. and just understanding how how connected we are as well and how how impacted we are by things that are happening far far away from our own countries right now uh, tell us just a moment about here you are you're a mother uh henry and holly i guess are your children tell us a little bit more about them and how they've perhaps given you a lesson about how world leaders act <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, I, I joke a lot about sometimes that dealing with diplomats and governments, uh, you think they'd be more mature than my kids, but in many times, no, uh, it's kind of the opposite. Um, no, but it's been, it's, it's really, it's really nice to, to actually, even, even nuclear weapons can be a bit of a difficult topic to talk to kids about. It's quite nice to involve uh, also kids in this idea that you can change things, you can organize and uh, and get involved. And my kids are even like sometimes negotiating at home and striking and it's a little bit annoying, but I'm also very proud when they do that. They are organizing against me and my husband. It's, it's quite exciting. <laughs> wow, what a 
powerful lesson for children to, to learn that they can make change. That's the only way to give them hope. Otherwise, the world seems overwhelming and scary exactly. and impossible. But once they get that idea that they can make the change, wow, then they feel empowered. But good for you. Exactly. Yeah, I know it's, it's really true. <laughs> well, speaking of that and speaking of making change, I mean, so tell us a little bit more what it was like. I mean, here you were getting ready to receive the most august, the most famous kind of prize in the world, the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, what did it feel like uh, as you were gearing up and getting ready to, to take that, to accept that prize? You know, I mean, like none of us do this work for glory and glamour. I mean, the peace movement work is not really a, about that. But I think, you know, one of the things that struck me uh, around the whole time of the Nobel Prize was how how important it is for ourselves to recognize um, the, the importance of our work. Uh, sometimes when you do this kind of work, it feels a bit hopeless. It feels like you're not getting anywhere or uh, you see on the news, things seems like they're just getting worse and you organize events, you know, have these little seminars, maybe 10 people show up, Did it, you know, are we just talking to ourselves? You have your petitions you, and it, like, it, it's hard work. So, to, to get that kind of recognition for, you know, a movement that is so broad from so many different countries, from so many different ages and communities. Um, and the Nobel Prize is something so like, everyone around the world knows what it is, right? Like, and it, it's so nice that it went to activists, people who are doing this kind of tireless work and people who are doing all of this kind of unglamorous, we're not heads of states. Uh, we're not, you know, these kind of celebrities or anything like that. We're just regular people uh, doing our, our our little activism, all in all in, in small pieces, and then bringing it all together in a big movement. And it was just such a fantastic moment, right, to be able to share that with the whole campaign and to be able to kind of also understand that somebody noticed somebody saw what we were doing and thought it was great because I think that sometimes in in this work you you sometimes wonder right I mean I can't be the only one who kind of like doubts that moments like oh is this actually making a difference are we ever going to achieve something uh, so having those moments of sort of celebration I think is really it was so important for the whole campaign and for our energy and to kind of our trust in that this work is meaningful and it's leading somewhere uh, and it, it's achieving results. Wow. And uh, I've watched the extraordinary address you gave uh, at the Nobel Prize award ceremony, and I'd recommend that everybody take a look at that. Tell us just a little bit of the gist of what you told, uh, what you told the Nobel Prize, Prize Committee upon accepting that prize. I mean, I think it was our chance, right, to really Talk to the talk to the world, and I think what we wanted to do was to really first communicate how urgent this issue is. That it is not a it's not in the past; it's right now. Um, but it's also full of hope. Like we can achieve change, and of course, for ICANN, it was also really important to you know we always center this conversation around the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. So this is not a theoretical weapon. This is not strategic stability, deterrence theory. Uh, it's a real bomb and it has a real impact on real people. So we of course also had uh, Setsuko Thurlow, a survivor of Hiroshima uh, with us to, to deliver uh, the acceptance speech together with me uh, to kind of also show that this is about the people who have experienced this and they are the ones who have to share their story with the world. Um, and it was also a bit of a, um, a moment for us to really tell the nuclear arms states that we're, we're coming for you now. We, we got this treaty, we're gonna bring it into force in the next thousand days. And, and then you're next, right? You, we're going to come and, and change the law and change your reality and how this weapon is perceived by the rest of the world. So yes, it was like I putting was, them I, on notice. Great, I was thrilled to hear that you used the prize money to launch this thousand day campaign to take the treaty which you had succeeded in getting passed, uh, you, you'd helped succeed with other people, of course, in getting passed by, uh, uh, what was it, 120 of the world's nations. Uh, and you said, okay, we're gonna use this prize money to get that implemented into actual law and we're gonna do it in 1000 days. Did you meet your goal? 
uh, uh, almost. It took us 120, uh, 1,028 days to achieve the goal. Uh, so we're, we're pretty happy with that. I'm a little bit, personally a little bit disappointed. I wanted to do it faster. Um, there was this little thing called coronavirus that came in between. We like to blame that, but um, no, we, we, we uh, yeah, 1,028 days from, from the Nobel Prize acceptance speech to the day we reached the 50th ratification. That was the threshold for the treaty to enter into force. Uh, so uh, we were extremely happy about that, of course. Well, that's, uh, that really is, is extraordinary. Now, um, I noticed that you said that the treaty categorically outlaws the worst weapons of mass destruction and establishes a clear pathway for their total elimination. Uh, so uh, now this treaty is legally in force. Uh, so why are there any nuclear weapons right now? <laughs> well, yeah, of course. I mean, uh, just uh, international law works, of course, that it's only binding on the countries that have joined it. So it's still optional for countries to bind themselves to this law. <coughs> right. So of course, the, the nine countries with nuclear weapons have not yet joined this treaty. Uh, we're working on that, uh, but it still creates a really powerful norm. So, and it, and it creates a really, a, a legally binding obligation for all the other countries that do join this treaty, that this weapon is banned. Um, and we see that, for example, in the past, we banned biological weapons, we banned chemical weapons, we banned landmines, custom missions. Not all countries have joined all these treaties. There are still countries that have not joined them, but in the world sort of perceives these weapons as illegitimate, you know, sort of delegitimized, not acceptable, uh, inhumane, and not really okay for a country to have it. So it really, we, we see, sometimes people talk about treaties as um, not enforceable or they weak or we can't force it on one, but they really have power and they really change behavior. And, and that's what we're going to do with this treaty now. So with or without the nuclear arms states on board, we are going to use this treaty to really change people's behavior and people's expectations on the nuclear arms states. And I think there's a lot of ways that normative change happen uh, before the kind of government acts. Well, weren't some of these previous acts that outlawed certain weapons like chemical and biological weapons or like uh, the landmines, for example, didn't they actually end up being in effect binding on the nations that had them because no longer could people help the company, you know, the companies that were manufacturing was no longer profitable, profitable to make them and so on. Didn't it actually have an impact uh, just like in the U.S., where like California will pass a law that all none of the companies want to market just to, just to California separate products, so they comply for the whole world. Wasn't there that kind of impact from some of these Ab previous laws? Absolutely. I mean, there's there are countries that have not signed the and joined the Bio and Chemical Weapons Convention, but all companies have stopped making. No, no company would make chemical weapons, um, and it, it's really regulated because the majority of states have done it, and these companies are international, right? They have to follow the laws for the sort of general international law. Uh, we see even in cases like landmines, for example, um, the U.S., Russia, China never signed those treaties. Yet they've really decommissioned so many landmines. There are no more like producers of these weapons, very few producers of these weapons. Um, the US, for example, has said that, you know, to a large extent, they will follow the rules in the treaty. They have this ex one exception in the border between North and South Korea. But aside from that, the US says, despite them not having joined the treaty, 20 years later, like, fine, we'll kind of follow the rules. Uh, with custom munitions, um, which is like these little small bombs that stays in the ground a little bit like landmines as well. That was banned by treaty in 2010. And the US, again, US, China, Russia didn't participate in the negotiations. They didn't join the treaty. Um, but through, for example, a lot of European countries joining the treaty, uh, the last American producer of cluster bombs, Textron, and this is a weapons company. They're not doing this for moral reasons, but they became blacklisted by all major European banks, for example, couldn't get loans um, and, and, and decided to stop producing uh, cluster munitions, which shows that even if the US government didn't agree with this treaty, the, it was just not practical for the companies to continue to produce its weapon. Once there's an international law banning something, 
they're going out of fashion, they're going out of style. It's not something that the business community wants to continue to invest in. So it's really, it really has a lot of power, these treaties. And that's also something that we're going to utilize with this treaty now that it's entered into force. Well, that, you know, that is really key. Uh, I mean, really, basically, and that's what we want to spend more time talking about, because then that really comes down to how do we personally get involved in enforcing this treaty? I mean, I think that this is something also that we, we have to see as a, as a, as a huge strength. Um, norms and what governments are allowed to do is, is really in our control. We can shape that. And I always like to take the example of, um, for example, uh, same-sex marriage in the United States. Uh, it was one of those issues that even Obama in his first campaign didn't publicly advocate for. Um, it, but state by state in the US and in pop culture and in, in just in, in business communities, the, the difference of it, it just changed, right? People just started accepting it and this like it was not okay anymore. And suddenly you see this huge shift um, and suddenly, you know, all, you know, most political representatives, I guess, of course, I support this, right? And the Supreme Court, because, you know, it, it's just like, um, we can't really rely on the government to lead. We have to change first. Right. So there's so many different things that you can do in order to, to help this shift, right? And based yeah. on this treaty now internationally, there's, there's things like divestment, for example, getting banks and pension funds to pull money out of the companies that are making nuclear weapons. It's not a huge amount of companies. It's like, maybe 40 companies in the world that we know that we know um and for example we can go to don't bank on the bond and see that uh, and you can see where the main banks if they are um if they have a policy to to prohibit investments in in these kind of weapons or not so we're working a lot and we've seen for example just last month um the irish sovereign wealth fund uh which is this big uh, national sort of investment fund of, of ireland as a state party to the to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons, they now sold off all their assets in these weapons companies. Wow! Because the country banned nuclear weapons, so they're selling them off, which means that 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 impacts these companies. So the more we do that, the better. Um, wow. Well, so tell us, isn't there a regulation in this treaty that not only says do we outlaw nuclear weapons, but we can't in any way cooperate? with others who are manufacturing them? Tell, tell us about that. Yeah, you. it's prohibited to assist with production of nuclear weapons or development of nuclear weapons or research on nuclear weapons. And of course, th that means financing. So you're not allowed to finance nuclear weapons production. Now, of course, you can, you can debate on how strictly that is interpreted. Um, it doesn't ban, you know, general cooperation on other issues with, with the countries or with, with um, that are in, that are building nuclear weapons, but specific activities that really contribute to nuclear weapons production uh, or nuclear weapons testing or development or maintenance is prohibited under this treaty. So you're not allowed to assist or encourage or induce uh, anything that's prohibited in this treaty. And that can be a really powerful instrument for us to use. And the more countries we get on board with this treaty uh, from the non-nuclear weapon states, the, the more pressure we put on the nuclear weapon states. I mean, we, we can't change the Russian government or the US or like China's government or even barely the US government in many ways, uh, their opinions right now, like, you know, immediately, but we can make it harder, right? And that's the powerful we have. Like we can make it more difficult. So it's really about increasing the kind of bar of what's acceptable and what's, you know, easy for them to do. And at some point, it's going to be harder for them, like with the custom munitions, for example, it's going to be harder for them to maintain nuclear weapons than to get rid of them. And I think that's sort of what we want to get towards. Excellent. Well, you know, that really is our fundamental responsibility as people to be part of that enforcement. In fact, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, well, first of all, uh, one of the very first resolutions, as you've mentioned, of the UN was to call for banning nuclear weapons. And that was unanimously passed, as was the Universal Declaration, which defined what the human rights are. And of course, our fundamental human right is the right to live. If we blow ourselves off the life planet, we've, we violated all of our rights. Uh, well, that declaration says that every individual and every organ of society shall strive by teaching and education 
to promote respect for these rights and freedoms and by progressive measures, national and international, to secure their universal and effective recognition and observance. In other words, that means all the nations of the world passing this, we're turning it back to us. It's up to up for us folks. We have the actual responsibility to secure uh, the universal and effective recognition of, of, of the fundamental rights that are passed in these international laws, which are all the rights that give us the right to live on this planet and to thrive on this planet. Uh, so as part of that, I'd like to go into more about that, the, the various arms. What are the, uh, what are the key arms or key components of people-powered enforcement of this treaty? Yeah, I mean, I think that that's really what it is. Like, you know, first, of course, we need to work through the democratic systems, right, to change the government's opinions. And that's through reaching out to Congress people, senators, local officials, and kind of build the public support and make sure that we we kind of urge candidates of uh, that, that are running for office to to support nuclear disarmament and support the treaty. Right. Um, but now that sometimes then, can get very frustrating because we feel exactly. like we're not getting anywhere, but that's only so, one arm, right? What are some yeah, of the other? That's just ways? one part. So, and there's other things that we can do, right? To shift the, the environment around the politicians. And for me, that is, you know, the banks and the divestments to go after the money. Uh, I think that's really, really important. For example, we did this recent research um, about how much money the nuclear arms st states are spending on nuclear weapons and showing that all of those contracts goes to these few companies. They earn millions, billions of dollars, right, on, on these modernization programs of nuclear weapons. And these companies like Lockheed Martin, like Boeing, like th these kind of companies, they spend an enormous amount on political campaigning so direct contributions to candidates. They spend money on lobbyists to lobby for more, more weapons, more nuclear weapons and more modernization programs. And they spend a lot of money on think tanks. So actually like putting money into the, those that are creating arguments for keeping nuclear weapons. So I think that you know going after the banks and pension funds and making sure that they divest from these companies, I think is a really effective strategy and something that we all can do. Where we keep our pension? Where do we keep our, our, our bank accounts? Uh, that's something that we can have an impact on. Another thing that's really important is um, universities. Uh, I think we don't really think so often that how involved universities are. We did this research report uh, and we can share that in the chat as well uh, later. Uh, looking at the 50 American universities that are involved in nuclear weapons production. Uh, and a lot of people don't know that, for example, University of California is part of build, has been part of building every single American nuclear weapon, uh, including those that have been tested on Marshall Islands, those that have been tested in Nevada. And students don't know, faculties barely know. Uh, it's not something they brag about, but it's something that we should really protest against. And, and we have a list of all these universities and students should be engaged in this. Um, Academics should be in, engaged in, in this and, and say like, you know, I don't want to be a part of those kind of projects. I think scientists um, uh, and in, in particularly nuclear scientists have a responsibility to say, hey, th this weapon is banned under international law, so I won't touch this research program. Like, I don't want to be a part of any research that is involving illegal weapons. Uh, so I think that's also how you can use to encourage people who work in these systems to like, no, I, it's not, I don't want to do this. Um, another thing that we worked a lot about is also the local governments, cities and state level, which they of course don't have the power to formally um, sign treaties, international treaties, but cities are the targets of these weapons. Um, if you think about it, I mean, where are the Russian nuclear weapons aimed at? They are aimed at Washington, Los Angeles, and uh, New York, Seattle, you know, the cities of the United States. So these cities have a, have a responsibility. They have no responsibility. They have no ability, no healthcare structure, no emergency service uh, kind of infrastructure to save its people if nuclear weapons are being used. So they have a responsibility to make sure that they are no longer targets of these weapons. So we've done that through uh, resolutions and motions on city and state level, urging um, cities to join uh, to support the treaty and call on the federal government. And we have several, Los Angeles, uh, I think um, uh, Portland, uh, Massachusetts, New Jersey, loads of cities around and Washington DC even have adopted these resolutions supporting the treaty and urging the federal government to join it. And the more 
the, you know, that do that, the more pressure. So that's also a really effective way to do, to kind of engage your local community. Wow, well, those are our four crucial arms, uh, the city appeal, the banks, uh, the universities and our investments. Uh, I'd like to run through a little bit more about each of them. Uh, first of all, starting with, uh, with say the universities, uh, you mentioned that the University of California was involved in creating every one of the nuclear weapons that we have. Um, and, uh, you know, the bulletin of atomic scientists, uh, you said that scientists have a responsibility to do something about it. Uh, didn't scientists actually do that from the very beginning with creating the bulletin of the atomic scientists? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that you know, the, the bulletin is like a, a really great place to to reach a lot of information about this They're really really great articles um but i think i think that universities have uh, and well and their really doomsday good... clock tell us about their doomsday yeah. clock well they had this research that show uh, a, a kind of a board of scientific experts that estimate the risk of the world ending pretty much uh the doomsday clock and it shows how close we are to, to doomsday, 100 seconds to midnight. Yeah, they're going down to seconds now. Uh, and it's the closest it's ever been. Uh, and we're talking as close as the Cuban Missile Crisis. And this is not just the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists, this is also other experts, uh, the ICRC, the, the United Nations Institute for Disarmament Research, uh, the Stockholm Institution, uh, Institute for Peace Research. They are all saying and warning very strongly um, we are at the kind of most dangerous point in our, our you know, in, in the world, like in, when it comes to nuclear weapons, the risks are increasing and we might not have to, that kind of tense situation like with the Cuban Missile Crisis where it's two countries very close to go into nuclear war, but instead that we have nine uh, countries, we have a lot more unpredictability in our system. We have a lot more high tech equipment that can create false information, accidents, misunderstanding, miscalculations. Maybe you remember, for example, a couple of years ago in Hawaii, when all citizens of Hawaii received an information uh, um, emergency message on their phone saying incoming ballistic missile. And this was happening during a very tense moment between the North Korea and the United States. Um, and people were panicking. And, and these kind of scenarios can happen very easily. And the longer we go without, you know, with this kind of tension, the, the more likely it is that something will happen one day. We've been very lucky so far. Yes, um, and I know there's a fabulous film that brings to life uh, the experience that happened in Hawaii and really it wakes your eyes up to what it's like folks to actually wake up and really think it's happening. People really thought it was happening. They thought nuclear mm -hmm. war was here. All the whole area, the whole, whole, and uh, it was, it, it's phenomenal to feel and sense that and watch that film. Uh, running through each of these arms, you, in addition to the universities where we have the scientists and of course universities were the hotbed of, of, of shifts from the Vietnam War. So clearly uh, they are a key lever for enforcing this treaty if we can get students fired up on it and realizing uh, how close this is to them. Uh, so well, let's talk a little bit more about the students and then let's move on to a question about the cities, but first on the students. Anything else about yeah. how we mobilize students to be part of this, uh, of enforcing this treaty? To, to make that click in their mind from, we're gonna be protesting nuclear weapons to we are the enforcers of the mm -hmm. of the law, you know, the universe not not going to protest this company to say, please, please don't make nuclear weapons. We don't like them, but saying it's the law. You are violating yeah. the law. Stop it. Yeah. yeah, and I think that that's really the the way to go. And I I, I think that students need to raise this. Uh, it needs to be a part of people. People need to know about it as well. I think most people don't know about it, and intentionally, of course, the schools don't uh, put that at the front page of their brochures about the universities it's something it's uh, sometimes quite hidden even we have to do a lot of digging to find out exactly who's involved in these things and it's very kind of covered in some sort of pride around we contribute to national security you know research but they don't want to admit straightforwardly that they are actually making weapon of mass destruction that could end the world as we know it so i think the the first step is for people to speak about it um and to start talking to your university about it, to kind of uh, send letters to the, the heads of departments, to 
um, in student papers, for example, and to really kind of make sure that it becomes a source of embarrassment uh, for the university rather than a source of pride and just a, a good income for the university. So I think that, that there's a lot of ways that students can engage with this, but most important is really to to make other people aware of it. It's not something that most of them want to brag about. So I think it's really focusing on, on kind of shaming them and stigmatizing it, like, and, and, and showing that the treaty, there's an international treaty that bans this. We wouldn't be proud of a university making chemical weapons. Uh, that would be terrible. Um, so why are we accepting that they make nuclear weapons? That is so, so crucial. Uh, and uh, we, you know, we saw, uh, that that power and I, uh, the teach-in movement that that's how we started the protest against Vietnam War. It started with informing people. It started with a teach-in mm -hmm. movement, and out of those teach-ins grew people's kids' awareness, and out of that awareness grew that incredible activism. So yes, you're so right. Mm -hmm. We need education there. Uh, moving on to the cities, I'm so glad that you mentioned cities because Gary uh, Davis, the film "The World Is My Country," that inspired this whole uh, podcast that I directed and Melanie produced. Uh, that's in that film, he calls it, and he has worked very hard to have a global cities movement. He said, you know, when you look at our planet, the nations aren't real. These were lines people drew on maps. You can't see them from outer space, but the cities are at night, it lights up and you see all the cities all over the world and they're dealing with real world problems and they're solving them. They're not just some political fiction. And he talked about bringing all the cities to help create, pass international law and make it binding. And there is a I understand there's a cities movement to do this. Tell us a little bit more about how we can get our cities to help enforce the law. Well, I mean, cities were a massive part of the nuclear peace movement in the 80s, uh, doing uh, resolutions and motions on, on local levels. And I think that's kind of what we're trying to replicate. And also, uh, you know, see, seeing how cities have really engaged with things like the Paris Agreement on climate change. And we saw a lot of American cities, for example, when Trump pulled out of the Paris Agreement, a lot of American cities say, hey, we're going to do it anyway. We're going we're gonna to implement our, our commitments under this treaty anyway. So I think that that's a really good model. Um, and many of these cities, particularly like the, the really big ones, I mean, they, you know, New York City, for example, is, is probably more like influential in shaping the world than some small countries even. Uh, today, so they have it might not be able to formally sign international law in that way, but they have an enormous sort of cultural and normative impact on on how we see things. So you know, I, I think that also a lot of people are finding much easier to engage with their city council than with their government. Uh, it feels much more closer. It's much more local. Like you said, it's where you live. It's where you are. It's where you can connect and relate to much more. And and for me, it's a really, you know, activism in, in a lot of ways is, is a lot of times to just, just doing things. It, it's not always about which is the most, you know, which would be the best thing to do, but to do the things that, that you can. Uh, and cities are things that you can, and it gives you also confidence. Oh, and I see so many, we just had this amazing story, some, uh, some high school students in Winnipeg, Canada, who just heard about the I Can Cities appeal and they wanted to try it. And they got Winnipeg in Canada to, uh, this, they went and did a testimony in the city council and they finally got them to approve this resolution, supporting the treaty and calling on the Canadian government to join it. And they were so excited. I mean, it was their first kind of real experience in, with advocacy and, and you know, asking someone to do, a politician to do something, and then they did it. And they were just so excited and happy. And it was like a whole kind of, you know, experience for them. And for me, that's also extremely important to give people that positive feeling about activism, that it's actually possible to achieve something. And you can, if you collaborate, if you work, if you, you know, you, you don't always succeed, of course, and you have to learn that it, it's, it's hard. You get a lot of no's on the way to that one yes. But just to see sort of people, um, you know, appealing to their local representative and how effective that actually has been. So I think we have something like, Six, seven hundred cities around the world, including many of the biggest cities, uh, such as Los Angeles, Sydney, Berlin, uh, Madrid, for example, Paris. Um, so it, it's it's extremely it, it's really really nice. 
Wow, this is so powerful and exciting. And, and that is you know, really what Gary was talking about when we make that click in our heads, as I've mentioned, from being uh, pleading and begging our governments to do things to saying, we are, the, we are enforcing the law and you are to halt this illegal behavior. Uh, and I wanna cover one more area before I throw it open to questions from everybody else, but I'd like you to tell us a little bit more about perhaps the key lever in all of this, and that is the financial. You know, we talk about divestment. Many people have investments. Some people say, well, I don't have investments. Well, do you have a bank account? How can we use that lever to enforce the law? Yeah, I mean, I think it's extremely effective to, to go for the divestment route. And again, it's something that, you know, we have to stop thinking about nuclear weapons as completely abstract. Oh, it's it's Kim Jong-un, it's Putin, it's Biden. What do I have to do with that? I can't change any of their minds. Like I, I feel very powerless and understand that there's so many parts of society that is complicit in that, including our banks, including our pension funds. So I, I think it's a, it's definitely something that people should be doing. And these banks, and, and we spend a lot of time right now after the treaty entered into force to focus on, on, on the financial part. And we keep hearing from them that they are definitely sensing how their uh, clients and people who have their investment with them are much more interested in where the money is being put now. And even their, even their staff, for example, I had this really interesting conversation with a, um, with a head of a bank who said that they are having, they had difficulties recruiting staff until they clearly out, you know, new sort of young students from business schools, they were not asking about, you know, what's my salary going to be? They were asking, what's your climate change policies? What's your sustainable development policies? Like, I want to work for a company that thinks about these things. And sometimes it's like greenwashing. We know that, of course, but it is a huge trend in also the business world that they have to think about these things. So I think that right now is a moment to really push your bank or your pension fund to to divest from weapons companies and particularly to be in line with international law because the more countries join this treaty, the trickier is going to be for all their subsidies and their kind of multilateral um, work that they do, their uh, multinational work. So if you are interested, you can go to a website called Don't Bank on the Bomb um, where you can see lists of the companies, of course, that are making nuclear weapons, but also you can search for your bank uh, and see if your bank is one of the good ones or one of the bad ones. Uh, and there's also material on like what you can say if you want to contact them. And of course, it's a sort of, uh, it's, it's something that we should make a habit of. If we go into a, a, a local office of a bank, we should just mention these things. What's your policy on banned weapons? Because uh, a lot of these, these companies ha have policies that ban chemical weapons and biological weapons and sometimes landmines and cross munitions but they don't have nuclear weapons included in that. And now the treaty this year entered into force, so now they have to add that. And that's what we're working on now. Wow, that is such a crucial, uh, crucial, crucial message. And before I turn it over to questions, I do wanna throw in one more. And that is, uh, in addition to the uh, finance side of the weapons, what about the buying side? Companies are very aware of their uh, public image. They want consumers, they want people to buy stuff. Um, what do you see as the possibility of evolving as another arm of this? Uh, perhaps, you know, in our film, The World is My Country, Gary shows this kind of smart gov app, you know, an app where you know, you'd walk into the store and you scan products and it'd say, beep, beep, this is a violator of international law. We're not gonna buy them. Oh, this one's complying mm. with the world law. They're green, they're, they're not doing any, they're not supplying or helping in any way, aiding or abetting any nation making, any company making nuclear weapons, we're gonna buy their product. Uh, what do you think about evolving uh, that that consumer arm? Uh, there's a little app called Bicot, uh, you know, kind of beginning of this kind of thing. But what do you think about developing that kind of uh, consumer purchase power arm of enforcing the treaty? I think it's really, I mean, I would love to do that. Um, the, the nuclear weapons producing companies, luckily, is not that many. Right. It's it's uh, if you compare it to, for example, fossil fuel industry or or other things like that, it's it's a much smaller. I think on our list we have around forty companies uh, in the world. Most of them are exclusively weapons companies um, and very focused on that. But there are some, like Honeywell, for example, that most people don't know that they are involved in working, making nuclear missiles. 
Um, and that's something that people should definitely be aware of. And it should be, to me, like, that should be a marketing problem for them. That should be something that as soon as you talk about them, people are like, oh yeah, oof, yeah, that's bad. Um, and I think that that's something about education and putting this out and maybe an app like that. I think that's a fantastic idea. Uh, and to constantly also remind people. Um, I think that that's also a job that we, we all as individuals can do. Uh, especially now when you have things like social media. And I sometimes like to, if I, if I have time and I come across one of these companies, I, I like to leave a little message. I'm like, oh, you shouldn't be making weapons of mass destruction. Oh, these weapons are illegal under international law. Stop doing that. Just to also show other people that there is someone out here who who protests this and don't think that's okay. And the more people who say that, the, the more it's going to be a problem for them. And for a company like Honeywell or Airbus, for example, the nuclear weapons part is minimal. It is not a big part of their kind of business model. If that starts really interfering with their profits, they're going to cut it. It's wow. not worth it for them. Uh, and we've seen that on other companies as well. That they, I can't remember the name now, but there was a company that um, after pressure from consumer, I can't remember what it was, like sold off their arm. Uh, I mean, the arm, the, 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 they sold it off and they continued to making it. So we didn't fully solve the problem. At least the company itself who sold it off recognized that this is a liability for us. And it should be, a, I think that's a, that's a step in the right direction, right? It's, it's a liability. And nobody wants to touch it, right? That because when nobody wants to touch it, it suddenly just bounces around. Um, and that connects to me also with the, we talked about scientists, but also employees that, you know, here, here in Geneva, there's a lot of tobacco companies based here. And you sometimes see on job apps, uh, job ads that these like really high paid marketing jobs, but people don't want a tobacco company on their CV. It's a little bit, once you go into a tobacco company and you work as a marketing executive for a tobacco company, you can't go anywhere else. That's not a popular thing for people. People are like, oh, you work for Philip Morris. Mm -hmm. That's not really great. Um, and I think we have to do that with these companies as well. It should be like stigmatized, right? It should be problematic to go and work for a company that makes weapons of mass destruction that are banned under international law, that shouldn't be acceptable. So we need to kind of increase that feeling of, oh, no, Lockheed Martin? No, oh, absolutely not. Um, that, that needs to come. Fantastic. Well, that is such an empowering thing to see how, how we can actually effectively begin the, to be the enforcers of law. Well, at that point, let me turn it open to questions because I know many of you have questions and this is a great opportunity to get talk, talk, to talk directly to Beatrice who is so crucial in this campaign. So Melanie, take it away for the question period. Oh goodness, thank you, yeah. Arthur and Beatrice. Oh, so we are, it's happening. This is happening. This is go time. We, we need everybody on board doing every little thing they can do, sending, you know, no, I'm not okay with you because you support nuclear. And the, the countries, other countries are getting on board. And yes, this is gonna, this is working right now. So thank you for your incredible work. I'm so impressed and I'm so excited because it feels good. It feels good to be on the right path now. That's where we are. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So yes, Thank let's you. go to questions. And if everyone could um, ask their question or comment, but keep them short if you can, we have quite a list. Our first one is Joanne. Joanne, please ask your question. Yes, um, uh, Beatrice, I have to say it is an absolute honor to be on a Zoom program with you. I am one of your loyal fans and have been uh, very privileged to be able to explain the treaty in our classes and to follow along. So my, uh, and, and I'm happy that Glenn is here with me because he's one of our co-presenters in our class and he, he gave the link for that. Um, but I did, I, I was curious because as the treaty was getting ratified, you know, I'd get students excited. Hey, we're up to 46, whoa, you know, and people would get all excited and they'd applaud. And I, I could see that it was an emotional appeal to the, to the, 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 the students in the class that we're hearing about this. So my question is what's happening with the 86 countries that have signed on? And I know you always used to predict that, well, it's just a question of time. So, but I haven't seen too many new ratifications lately. So I'm wondering what that whole 
process is about? Uh, yeah, I'm a little bit frustrated with the pace right now as well. Well, it's, uh, it's, we've, we've been in a little bit, we made such a big push, right, to get to 50. Uh, and a couple came in afterwards also, they just missed the 50 first and they it's 51, 52, 53. Uh, the spring is always quite lo low activities in parliaments for that. Uh, we've noticed that it really picks up in the autumn uh, for some reason. Uh, we do have about 10 that are getting close to ratifying. Um, for example, last night, uh, the Chilean parliament uh, adopted the, the decision to ratify the treaty. Uh, so now they, the decision is made, it's going to happen. It's just about, uh, I'm learning so much about really random countries, different ratification and national legislation measures. Like it's, it's a very interesting, probably some academic needs to write books about this at some point. Um, but now it needs to be signed uh, by the president and then delivered to the UN and the secretary general in New York. And that can take, I mean, for some of these countries, Cote d'Ivoire is like, yes, yes, we just need the president to sign, but he doesn't seem to be signing it. I don't know what, what the holdup is. It's just like bureaucracy. It's like so many layers. The Chilean parliament, for example, uh, I was it was nice to see them voting, but they've been voting five times. First, the, uh, foreign policy committee, then the legal committee, then the Senate's first reading, Senate's second reading, and then now the, it's just like, how many steps can you have? But I mean, as you probably know, in the United States, it probably takes a long, very long time for the US to ratify treaties. Um, and it's very similar for many other countries. So it is ticking on that kind of work. Um, the pandemic has definitely slowed things down. Uh, not just in terms of, you know, of course, the parliaments were not meeting in the beginning. Uh, and then like work has picked up in one way, but it's hard to kind of travel and organize the meetings and gatherings to kind of get, get it high up on the agenda. And this is really our challenge with a lot of these countries. They are supportive, these 86 countries that have signed it, they are supportive. It's just, it's not at the top of their agenda. They have bigger problems right now during the COVID that they are worried about. It just keeps dropping off unless there are activists pushing, saying this is really important. Uh, it's really easy for it to just st get stuck on some bureaucrat's desk for quite a long time. Uh, so we have to kind of continue to push that forward. Uh, these processes do take time. It shouldn't take so, so much time though that uh, you know we're going to wait forever, but we, we, we're hoping for a few more months now in September. Yes, my goodness. Yeah, then that's up to us to get on board and call, you know, whichever country you're in, get on board because that makes a huge difference. They, that is, I do that all the time. I'm calling, I leave comments to the White House, you know, dear Mr. President. So yes, that counts. They listen and the, com and the companies listen to that too. So yes, please, please. Okay, so now a oh, quick question from our comment from Richard. Richard, go right ahead. Thank you very much, Melanie. And thank you, Arthur. And thank you, uh, Beatrice. It's uh, great to see you again. Um, I'll just follow up on uh, Joanne's uh, question. Uh, where are we at now with the uh, first meeting of the state parties? I gather it's been delayed uh, yet again. And how many of the umbrella countries uh, are going to come as observers uh, to that? And then I have a second question on Rotary, but I'll let you answer that one first. Um, yeah, so the meeting of states parties was originally intended to be held in January. Uh, it's because of COVID and the UN schedule of meetings that is being kind of up in the air. They postponed it to March. Um, it's actually, I think, a good thing for us that it's it's pushed back a little bit. It would allow us to have more participants coming and to you know make sure that more parts of the world, uh, given the membership of the treaty at the moment, is very heavily focused on uh, Latin America, Africa, Asia, Pacific. Uh, and these are the countries, these are the regions in the world that are least vaccinated at the moment. So it will give a little bit more time for everyone to get vaccinated so we can actually make sure that people make it to Vienna. So March 22nd to 24th uh, is, is the, the date. And we're, I mean, we're hoping that a lot of countries that also haven't signed yet will show up as observers. I think we're seeing some really good signals from some umbrella states. Uh, there's a couple of countries that have yet not 
um, sign that had committed to go as an observer, Switzerland, Sweden, Finland, for example, uh, but they should also sign eventually. So it's more uh, uh, pushing them to, to also make the decision to sign. Uh, but we're working a lot now on two really important countries in NATO, Germany and Norway, who could be real a uh, game changer in this alliance because there's an election in Germany now in September, there's an election in Norway in, as well, same month. Um, and it's looking that there will be change of governments and it's looking like it will be much more TPNW friendly parties in government. Um, and of course we know that even the most progressive politician when they get into power, they uh, they fold. <laughs> so we, it's, it's not like we have um, we think that that's automatically going to change everything, but I think we're going to have much more receptive politicians in these governments, which will give us an, an, uh, a great opportunity to get them to be observer states and then work towards getting them to sign the treaty. And once we get NATO states on board, I think that that's going to be a huge game changer for this whole issue. Once the kind of alliance of Western countries that pretend like weapons of mass destruction is completely normal and sane behavior, once that breaks, it breaks. Um, and that's also why they are so terrified of this treaty, because they know that one, you know, eventually one of them will fall for the pressure. I put my Rotary hat on. And as you know, uh, Rotary has come out with a social responsible investing policy now and is uh, going to get rid of uh, its investments in general dynamics, hopefully, um, that they've done that. Uh, we're working on the ICANN, we're working on Don't Bank on the Bomb. We've got a conference coming up with our president, uh, Rotary International President, Shekhar Mehta, along with the International Committee of the Red Cross President, mm -hmm. Peter Maurer, and along with uh, Azumi Nakamichi, or Matsu, uh, from uh, the UN uh, Office of Disarmament. So the question then is, uh, what further can Rotary do to help uh, this whole process? And I wonder, uh, the MPT has gone nowhere on Article 6 for the last 51 years. Um, the uh, nine, NATO, or nine nuclear countries are obviously boycotting the TPNW and first state parties. Um, hopefully we'll get the observers from the umbrella countries, as you say. I'm wondering though, is there room for a third venue, namely another uh, disarmament conference, say, sponsored by Rotary, where we bring in uh, mediators for the five or seven or nine nuclear countries to work on them uh, to uh, get rid of their nuclear weapons. Absolutely. I mean, I think the, the more the better. I, I'm, I'm very much a favor of the kind of thinking that there is not one thing that's going to fix this problem. Uh, but we have to kind of attack this problem from all possible angles, right? From, from politicians and media and scientists and grassroots and TikTok use and the, these kind of things. And we have to do it in, in, in different versions and in different ways, using different arguments, whatever works, right? And whatever people feel like they want to do it. That's what I meant, like, um, the best kind of activism is the one that, you know, is, is natural and, and happens. Um, rather than like a, a, some kind of ideal scenario, we're going to think about what's the one best thing to do. Like just do whatever makes sense to you with whatever community you have around you and wherever you feel like you could do something. And then together, everything will, will change things. But I think that there are many ways that Rotary can, can have an enormous amount of impact. I mean, it has so many members and, and such a wide range. Um, for example, I mean, I'm very excited to hear that there's a possibility of divesting uh, and, and changing uh, 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 investment policy like that. I would love for that to be communicated very widely. As a result of the TPNW, we are selling off these assets in this company. Uh, as of it, because I think that international law would only work if people believe that it works. It's like, it's a lot of these things that's just, it's a lot of it is in, in, in sort of people's minds and beliefs rather than concrete stuff. So. If people believe this treaty is effective, it will be more effective. So when we say that we're taking this action because of the treaty, that really strengthens the treaty in so many different ways. So having Rotary like communicate that, sending that out to members of Rotary and having them communicate that and saying, you know, that that's a really great step, I think is extremely 
helpful and it will help activists and campaigners in other countries that are trying to get change. And it will help, help us argue that, hey, look, it's having an impact. The treaty that we all worked on is now making specific kind of trouble for this company, right? And it's like having an impact. So I think all of the things that we do, we need to be much better at communicating that and putting that out as really you know important developments because that will kind of increase people's faith in international law and in norms and that will strengthen it and make it more powerful and make it have a bit more of an impact. Yes, and um, to not be afraid or whatever stopping people from not getting on board. I mean, this is obvious, this is a fact. You know, we could all die any second. So, okay, let's do something about it. So, Anne, go right ahead. Go right ahead. Beatrice, uh, in four years, we've made a lot of progress inside Rotary. We really believe that working from the, we are really grassroots organization. We have people with very, very different views. So we have a tremendous audience of people who've never heard this word. But yes, we, we now have a policy to divest right. from nuclear weapons, climate change, and anything that hurts um, re relationship and inclusiveness um, between all of us. Um, I, I want to acknowledge that Rotary is growing because we have nuclear weapons program in it. It's not official program, but we have people like Joanne Dufour and um, Ranjit Jayasakara from Sri Lanka has joined the Sri Lankan club, bringing in uh, the Sri Lankan Doctors and Borders, a colleague of Dr. Helfand. Uh, we have Joseph Gerson who has just joined. So we hope to have our own little powerhouse here. Uh, Beatrice, we're really interested in attending the TPNW. We have nine civil society observers who were all ready to go to the NPT meeting when it was postponed. We still don't know if we're going to get to go to the to the next one. But I just want to tell you, and you probably haven't decided, or no, the world body has not decided. The TPNW states parties have not decided about civil society observers. But I bet we could have twenty people there because people are already fired up about the being at the NPT meetings. So uh, that's, that's my wish for you. And anything you might have to say about what a business and professional organization could do as a follow-up to Shakar Mehta, our president's speech at the United Nations. Mm. No, I think that's, I mean, great. I, I, honestly, there will be civil society in Vienna. We don't know the numbers yet. I think it's just so hard to predict right now with the, with the pandemic still going on and now with the Delta variant uh raging across the world um it it's it's a challenge uh we will plan both um to be at the government conference but also civil society events um i uh, last time we were in vienna we had this massive conference for over 600 people um some of you might have been there actually um and it was really great fun i'm, I'm not sure we'll dare to plan something that big it just doesn't feel safe at the moment. So it probably will be a bit smaller size. But what we are doing now, and I think that we, this is something that everyone will do forever, is always to make everything hybrid now. So that there will be live stream from the government conference. There will be um, sort of interactive ways to participate from home as well uh, in the meetings, in the civil society events, in different things. I think we have to think very creatively in the coming years. And, making sure that we don't all have to put 2000 people on a plane to go somewhere. Um, but to really think about how to utilize the, all this knowledge that we discovered now on how to organize things online like this. I mean, it's really great. Um, and, and to use that, but I mean, we, but I also want to sort of flag that I don't think we should give up on in-person meeting because I think there's something very special with meeting, right? And I, I for one, has I'm missing it so much. It's like the actual connection with people that you get and and the having fun part. I mean, I, I, I the kind of going for a, a social event afterwards, a dinner afterwards, laughing over a coffee break. I think that's also extremely important to have to to channel that enthusiasm and motivation that you talked about, Anne. Because I think that's also part of being in this movement is, is to have that kind of energy around us. So we're hoping to organize events. Um, we'll, we'll share information as we get closer. Uh, we don't know how many we can be, uh, but hopefully enough so that it will become a really nice event. 
Well, we will be your partner with us. We can help you on the ground and um, we can host some of these sessions. Um, we really want to be there. Four of us went to the MPT in 2019 at the review, and we just came away just thrilled with what we learned and the partners we met, which just made all the difference. We need to be there, but virtual is better than just wondering what's going on. Thanks. Mm. Well, let's go to Andre. Andre, go right ahead. Oh, namaste. Hello, Beatrice. Thank you for all that, that you do. And uh, I think we have an amazing opportunity at our fingertips because with the Afghanistan war proving that war doesn't work, now's the time to mobilize the people to stop war. And there's anti-war groups everywhere. But the, and Secretary General Guterres, because of COVID, called for a global ceasefire. And that to me was the most profound action that could have ever happened. And so now I'd like to ask you to investigate a strategy that I've designed to bring Guterres into the play to now get the people in the whole world, the people in every country to participate in a global movement of nonviolence. It's an anti-war movement, but it's also a movement of goodwill. And that's, we need both because of just stopping nuclear, that's not changing our mindset. We need to work to the people, as Gandhi said, change their minds, not their, not, not their uh, ability to hit someone over the head. Mm. So please consider, it. I've written to you before, and I hope that we can communicate again and, uh, and talk about the specific strategy. Mm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, there's so many issues to, to um tackle and for for us i mean we see we really see this issue like nuclear weapons like yes it's one weapon but it's part of a bigger movement of like reducing what governments are allowed to do you know starting with the geneva conventions and then chipping away at uh, biological weapons, chemical weapons, different, you know, landmines, cluster missions, nuclear weapons. We have another camps, kind of sister campaign, the campaign to stop killer robots, artificial intelligence weapons that are going to ban next. And mm -hmm. it's, it's, I think it's important to keep focus on this, the bigger picture of stopping war, um, but also make it you know, practical for people by breaking it down into smaller chunks that we can take one step at a time to get to that goal. Well, only because of the emergency, the, the all the Nobel laureates, 100 or 150, just wrote an urgent call to action, and uh, the doomsday clock, and the so, uh, the elders have been out speaking that we need hope and faith. So yes, we need a little of everything, but the but if we don't get the people in every country together, then we're not going to do it. But right, and now we have the opportunities. So. Yeah. I'll send a letter to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Andre. Yes. And quickly, let's go to Glenn. Glenn, go right ahead. Hi, thank you. Um, I put a note in the chat uh, a moment ago saying that that no government from a top down will ever solve these kinds of big problems, whether it's nuclear weapons or climate or whatever. All these things can be solved by grassroots movements from the bottom up. And Part of what we have to do is debunk this deterrence myth. And I posted something in the chat about that earlier in the conversation, but also tap into people's values because um, people at a, a political head level disagree about politics, but it's possible to tap into people's uh, heart level values and find some ability to get some leverage and move people uh, I don't have any kids, but I know people who do have kids and they want a better future for their kids. And I know people who have grandkids and great grandkids and they want a better future. And so it's possible to pivot from those kinds of things or all the great religions talk about love and compassion and the unity of all humanity. We can tap into people's religious, spiritual, parental, uh, heartfelt values and get some some leverage there. So I'm urging us to do grassroots organizing 
that will strategically tap into people's core values and help them move this way. I'm going to post something in the blog in just a moment now about some other course, another course series that I conduct free online about how to organize nonviolent grassroots movements for any issue you care about. And I already had put a note in there about the course that Joanne and I and two other people teach, and some of the people in this call in this call here have already taken. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely agreeing with you, and I think it's also really important to remind ourselves that just what you started with, Glenn, like the governments are just not going to change on their own. It's not just about hoping that one day a leader will be like, I'm going to do the right thing. I mean, we, the governments are built of structures that are withhold, with, you know, won't let that change happen, even if a very progressive politician comes in. So I think it's really uh, and instead of being discouraged by that, I think we should be encouraged, right? Because it's in our power to change it. And, and change will happen when, when, when we do it. And I completely agree that it's it, we need to use people's faith, people's um, emotion. If you talk to almost anyone, even people that you see right now on the internet being really horrible, when you talk to people face to face, most people are nice. And po most people want the same thing. They want to be happy. They want safety for their family and friends. and um, and I think that that's really, you know, we need to appeal to that. Uh, for us, for example, the 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 role of uh, Pope Francis has been really important. Uh, and I think that the Catholic Church coming out suddenly very strongly against even do nuclear deterrence, it's a huge it opens up a huge opportunity to to reach Catholic people all around the world. And I know the other other faiths and and other communities uh, we can do the same. So yeah, I, I really, I really agree with that. Yeah, and and uh, just real quick, we had a co two comments uh, in the chat. We had Peter just wondering, is there a way you can t uh, talk to nuclear scientists? They, you know, they're always saying it's clean energy, and a lot of people say that clean energy. We need nuclear. And then Michael is kind of back, in, uh, back to back with that. He's a a hospital security guard and, and he's just wondering how to reach people who are really opposed politically and it just seems like you're you know trying to there's two different there's two different information going on you know people are blaming this or that uh, i guess we don't need everybody to be on board to have things change but do you have a suggestion a nice way to kind of uh, talk to people who really don't agree that this is a problem mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's, you know, to talk about the, the humanitarian impact is always a good sort of way to, to frame the issue. Uh, if we start talking about sort of strategic stability or deterrence, it's very easy to get into an abstract power conversation. I even noticed that in meetings, like if it starts with that conversation, I struggle with the arguments, but if it starts with a humanitarian, like this is what happens when nuclear weapons are used. This is what the blast does. This is what radiation does. There is no, no, uh, you know, healthcare services that can can help you. Uh, there are no. I mean, and I think that we can use the pandemic, you know, and 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 the doctors kind of hospitals being overwhelmed. And imagine if it's a nuclear detonation, right? Like it would be a lot worse than than that. Uh, or use the, the fires in California, for example. I mean, the firestorm after nuclear weapons attack that will just, you know, if even if you survive the initial blast, the, the firestorms would draw out oxygen, like wipe out and knock over buildings. Um, and there will be no way the fire departments will be able to respond to that. So kind of use these practical examples because it's very difficult to argue against that. Mm. And what happens then is the person will just say, and I've heard people say that, I've heard like a former deputy secretary general NATO say, well, I just don't think it's gonna happen. Well, I'm sorry, but the existence of humanity, just because you don't think it's gonna happen, that's not good enough for me. Yeah. Um, so I think that we can kind of use the really practical conversations on the humanitarian impact to, to, to create the conversation. But then of course you can't win everyone. So also we have to focus on the people that we can convince. Yeah. Um, we might not need to convince everyone. Uh, we need to convince the people around us. And I think that that's extremely powerful as well to focus on the people who are actually in favor. Most people are in favor of this. They just don't believe that it's possible. Yeah. And to me, that's the biggest challenge is the people's confidence on this issue is not very strong. 
they're like every when I meet people at parties and tell them what to do and they're like oh that seems nice but it's not going to happen is it uh, and I think that's the challenge right to make and I think that that's why the treaty is so important because it gives this sense of confidence to people and it gives this sense of oh it's actually happening and and like Joanne talked about how people get excited about the numbers going up it, it, it inspires confidence and that itself generates like leverage and power in our activism so I, I think it's important to not be too discouraged of the naysayers and really kind of focus on what you can achieve yeah. and, and the things that you can do. Great. I love that. Thank you so much, Beatrice. And we got to let you go. Thank you so much for staying. We love everything. Um, I want to get it back to Arthur for the close. Arthur, take it away. Well, this has been one of our most extraordinary podcasts. We are so thrilled with you and with the powerful, powerful message that you've given each of us. <clears throat> You know, I, uh, I have behind me, I want people to invite them to come to the peoplepoweredplanet.com uh, to watch the replay and tell all their friends about it, send a link to it, uh, and go to theworldismycountry.com to sign up to get the film. And you may notice I also have the Wizard of Oz post poster behind me. And that's because uh, Gary and I both loved that play. He, he had performed it one time in it. And uh, what... Uh, what was the key thing was that here Dorothy was begging and pleading, we have to find the powerful wizard. He's got to save us. We've got to get we've got to get a president to save us. We've got to elect someone else to save us. And all along, the power was in her. All she had to do was click her heels together and do it. Well, you've shown us how we can all click our heels together and abolish nuclear weapons, how we can all click our heels together and enforce the treaty. So uh, thank you so much for this extraordinary talk. Uh, tell us one more time uh, how people can join with your effort, how they can be a part of ICANN, how they can contribute to it, uh, how they can join, how they can join you and, and, and Don't Bank on the Bomb and continue this extraordinary effort and help make sure there is a, a wonderful future for, uh, for, your, for your children and all the children everywhere. Thank you so much. It's been really, really nice to talk to you and really nice to see some of your faces as well. Um, and yeah, we, you can go, some of you are already involved in some of the partner organizations and in and, and, and different ways. Um, and you can go to ICANW.org, our website, uh, where you can sign up for information, for news. You can um, also look at different kind of special reports on funding or on um the universities uh, don't bank on the bomb for the divestment side so you can explore the website um if you are on social media you know the our twitter or instagram is also a really great place to kind of constantly see updates and what people we try to share what people are doing around the world because i think that that's one of the most powerful things about being a part of a, a movement is to see that you're not alone that there are people around the world doing things every day for this issue uh, so do if you if you do follow uh, use social media, do make sure that you follow ICANN there. You can find the the accounts on our on our website at the bottom. You can see the little icons you click on. Um, and yeah, and if you're part of an organization an NGO that's not a partner of ICANN, you should apply for partnership. Um, that way you get to be part of the kind of uh, official partner organizations of ICANN and have access to a lot of resources and our information and regular updates invitations to the meeting of states parties and things like that uh, and you can find that information on the website as well so the website is a great place to go and find everything thank you everyone for joining us for another podcast of the people powered planet where each week you will hear more amazing solutionaries thank you beatrice and thank you all of you and goodbye world citizen lift up your voices oh you know we got something to say all we need is the same directions heading in one way. Thank you for watching. Please subscribe to our channel and like this video.